uh, as I mentioned in the opening statements, we've had tremendous interest in this forum um, to include uh, former Vice President Al Gore, who was very interested in attending and unfortunately couldn't because of his travel schedule. He's out of the country. But we wanted to kick off, and he wanted to kick off the Game Changer session. It's something which he feels passionately about. So he recorded a message for the, for the conference and for the audience. Hello, and thank you to the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory for inviting me to speak and for hosting this important gathering. As many in the security arena are becoming increasingly aware, and as you've already discussed extensively here today, the climate crisis is one of the most consequential threats to global security. Not only are the impacts of this crisis increasingly dire, but so too is our continued dependence on fossil fuels controlled by petrostates. <laughs> we certainly have seen the risks involved in that uh, dependence with Putin's uh, evil uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, unjustified, uh, cruel evil. We don't want to be dependent on these petrostate dictators. And Europe has gotten the message and really accelerated the transition. But the rest of the world must come to grips with the same security threat inherent in the climate crisis. So it's urgent that we bring every resource to bear in order to solve this crisis. The intelligence community, particularly in the United States, has played a very significant role in providing the data that underpins a great deal of the scientific knowledge that we have today about the climate crisis. In the 1980s and throughout the 1990s, I was very fortunate to be able to work quite closely with the CIA, the Pentagon, uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and others uh, to develop a program called MEDEA, which granted climate scientists, after full careful clearance, access to an incredible array of top secret uh, data, including satellite imagery from the intelligence community. That access enabled big leaps forward in our early understanding of the impacts of everything from the loss of Arctic sea ice in summer to uh, the burgeoning wildfire breakout patterns in particularly in North America and Australia but also elsewhere. Uh, and as satellite and remote sensing technology has developed, evolved, and proliferated, millions of people now have access to information that even a decade ago was limited to just a, a limited few. Indeed, we are now entering an era of radical transparency with environmental data, one that not only enables us to understand and prepare for the future impacts of the climate crisis, but it helps to accelerate the development of solutions and to increase accountability uh, within the global efforts underway now to radically reduce emissions as quickly as possible. With rapid advances in artificial intelligence, we can now analyze and process data in ways that are making what was previously invisible visible, at least to the human eye. Uh, the Climate Trace Coalition, of which I'm a proud co-founder, and by the way, TRACE stands for Tracking Real-Time Atmospheric Carbon Emissions, um, and you're going to hear uh, from our fantastic colleagues at APL about it uh, momentarily, but Climate Trace is doing this using artificial intelligence to track greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, we're harnessing information every day from more than 300 existing satellites, 11,100 remote sensors, air, air base, sea base, land base, uh, and lots of public data on the internet provided from, by governments around the world and uh, in the business world. Uh, and we're combining it all in machine learning al algorithms that get smarter every day in order to pinpoint precisely where emissions are coming from and to measure exactly how much is coming 
from each source. What is the trend? Is it going up? Is it going down? Uh, and we also collect the metadata, which is useful for those who are active in trying to convert those <laughs> global warming pollution sources to alternate technologies. In any case, as we've seen in our work with Climate Trace, in order to fully usher in the radical transparency we need to solve the climate crisis, collaboration is the key. That means, among other things, finding creative ways for governments to work with scientists and with civilians. And it means increasing access to unclassified and declassified data sets. And it means committing ourselves to treating this crisis with the extreme urgency that it demands. This is the most important decade of any of our lifetimes. Now is our moment to support the game-changing game efforts that are needed to help solve the climate crisis and to safeguard the future of humanity. So for all that you all are doing, thank you. Great. Um, <laughs> Uh, welcome back. Uh, in the morning, we had two outstanding panels on goals and gaps. And now, as Mr. Gore just introduced, we're going to shift our focus to technological solutions or game changers. We have three panels lined up for this afternoon, and we'll be discussing exciting technology, research, and initiatives with the potential to provide a disruptive advantage for the United States at the intersection of national security and climate, intelli and, and climate change. Uh, I'm Bar Paul Hamus. I'm the head of the Intelligence Systems Center here at APL. And the goal of the center is to invent the future for uh, intelligence systems for our nation. And under that goal, one of the things that we work on is developing and applying artificial intelligence to climate-related national security challenges. I'm really excited to be moderating this first panel on climate intelligence. And at this time, I'd like to uh, just pause and welcome our panelists here. Uh, we have uh, an accomplished set of scientists, engineers, and innovators. And they'll be introducing themselves to you in a, a few minutes. Um, but before we get into that, I just wanted to set a little bit of context for our discussion. Uh, as we think about the anticipated impact of climate change on national security, we face uncertainty and uh, we lack situational awareness. And we heard about this uh, a number of times this morning. Uh, during the goals, uh, we, there was some discussion about a climate ready force and how we need intelligence to uh, enable that. And we also heard about uh, an intelligence component and, an, and a surveillance component to um, the climate command that was introduced. And then this came up a number of times when we were talking about the gap. So it's, it's uh, an important topic. Uh, we'll never achieve you know, complete and total situational awareness. But as we strive to do that, uh, we basically, there's a few things that we need to do to fill out this intelligence pipeline. Uh, identify the data that we need, come up with the methods and the sensors to collect that data, uh, the, develop the analytics and the analysis to turn that data into actionable insight. And then finally, we, we need to incorporate that actionable insight into our processes and our planning and our decision making. Because we don't want to just study the problem. We want to take action that will make our uh, force more climate ready. Um, that's exactly what our panelists are doing, um, developing the technology, the tools, and the techniques needed to increase our climate intelligence. So uh, with that, uh, let's meet our panelists. I've, I've asked each panelist to introduce themselves and their organization and spend a few minutes talking about how they approach creating game-changing technologies for climate intelligence. So we'll get started with Steve Thur who is the Assistant Administrator for Research at NOAA. Steve? Good afternoon, everyone. All right. So I start with these pictures on purpose. Bart teed up this conversation focused on why we do what we do. And these photos 
are exemplars of why we at NOAA do what we do. We provide climate intelligence to address things like food security, the availability of water, extreme events like the wildfires we're being affected by now, and also tropical cyclones. But that first image, that next generation, that second generation down, whether they're going to have the opportunities that we have enjoyed is why we do what we do. And so when I was invited to speak to this panel, I was quite excited to make the connection between our civilian agency's efforts and those in the defense and intelligence communities and how climate is an overlay that will affect all of what we're doing for the next several decades. My employment contract, I'm required to show data in every presentation I give. Here's the one slide I'm going to show you. It's ridiculously busy. NOAA tracks the number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters every year. This data set goes back to 1980. And the colored bars are different kinds of disasters, but I want you to notice the left-hand side of the slide. From 1980 until roughly the mid-2000s, there's no discernible pattern in the height of those bars. Relatively few, four to six, seven per year. And then in the mid-2000s, the pattern changes, and it dramatically increases. We had a peak of 22 events a couple of years ago. Last year, we had 18 separate $1 billion disasters in our country. The data are inflation adjusted. And so what this tells us is there are three things going on. First, our climate is changing. That's perhaps the most obvious. The second is that our country has more people, and we have built more infrastructure that is vulnerable. And the third is that what we have built is more costly to replace than it used to be. So we show this slide to provide the context that what we've experienced in roughly the last 15 to 18 years is likely to continue and get worse. It has implications for where and how we live. It has implications for insurance markets, our personal and national finances. So what are we doing about it? NOAA, at a, at a top level, our highest priority is producing a climate-ready nation. What does that mean? That means we have to collect the observations necessary to feed into models to predict how the environment is going to change and how those changes impact humans. Climate change is literally global. For us to be able to do what I just said for the United States, we have to be able to model the entire Earth system. And that has implications for a lot of what you, focused externally, could use for climate intelligence in other parts of the world. This is an image of a sea level rise viewer. It's focused in the Greater Hampton Roads area. Um, relatively simplistic in that it uses baseline information that is applicable nationwide. We have more specific and refined products for specific regions. There's a slider on the left. You can pair projected sea level rise with what is going to be inundated at what stage in the future. We have provided 1,774 military installations, precise estimates of sea level rise and flood inundation estimates for around the world. That's an element of climate innovation that we are bringing now toward other civilian agencies like FEMA, looking at uh, future scenarios for riverine and aerial flooding. We just met recently with Housing and Urban Development looking at public housing and where they have vulnerabilities and more importantly, where they're going to fund the siting of new public housing so that they're not vulnerable going forward. Some of the game changers. We need three things to provide climate information. The first is observations of the environment. The second is models, and that's human ingenuity. And the third is high-performance computing to crunch it all. These are three images uh, of new uncrewed systems that are providing us information about the oceans. And I'm going to talk in my remarks later quite a bit about the oceans, because the climate crisis is driven by the ocean, and it is also an ocean crisis. 90% of the excess energy absorbed by our planet has been stored in the oceans. 25% of the excess carbon dioxide we have emitted has been dissolved into the oceans, and that will continue for decades, regardless of what we do with current emissions. 
It is the pump that regulates our global climate. In April of this year, we set a record, unfortunately. The global sea surface temperature average for the month was the highest it has ever been, 21.1 degrees Celsius. It beat the May 2016 record. That record, over the next six months, produced huge changes in the ocean that destabilized fisheries that led to famine in many countries. We're expecting that now. A huge difference is that in May, we were already experiencing El Nino. Today, four hours ago, at 9 a.m., NOAA released the statement that we are now officially in an El Nino pattern, and we were already at the warmest our oceans have ever been. We're expecting potentially full degree Celsius changes through the end of the year, and that would be quite massive. So new observational technologies for the ocean are going to get us some of what we need and how we, as a community, universities, private industry, other federal agencies work to collect those observations will help drive some of the game changers we'll talk about later. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, our next panelist, uh, her name's actually already come up uh, a few times this morning. So Erin <laughs> Sikorsky joins us, who is the director of the Center for Climate and Security. Erin? Great. Thanks so much, Bart. It's really a pleasure to be here. And like Joe Bryan on the previous panel, who said he was the one that stuck out amongst the panel, I too am not an engineer, I'm not a scientist, I may be a political scientist if you stretch a bit, but I did work in the US intelligence community for a long time, and I led climate and environment analysis across the IC before I left and, and came to join the Center for Climate and Security. So when I think about game changers and what I was planning to focus on today is, is less about, for me, the new tools themselves, but how we use the tools and how the intelligence and security community partners with scientific and technological experts to leverage these tools to do their job, right? Which at the core of their job as intelligence analysts is to provide strategic warning and decision advantage to US uh, senior political military leaders. And climate poses, I think, a real challenge for the intelligence community. And I think that we see this in the reports and the work that the intelligence community is doing on climate in that I think there's still a lot of underscoping, frankly, of risk. And one of the reasons for that underscoping is I have just a few headlines here on the slide that show you how uh, quickly things are changing vis-a-vis -vis our understanding of climate, that the rapidity and the intensity of climate hazards, um, even scientists, uh, you know, these are just some headlines showing that what we thought about the climate a few years ago is actually uh, not what we think today, right? Things are much more intense, the Arctic's warming much faster, right, than we thought, and I think it's hard for the intelligence community, frankly, to keep up with some of that science. And you, the national intelligence estimate that the, um, uh, the intelligence community completed a couple of years ago now on climate, it's unclassified. I highly encourage folks to read it if they haven't. I assume everyone in this room has. It's an excellent document. But even in there, you see, I think, an underscoping still of the risk. And this is one chart in the intelligence estimate that shows when we're supposed to expect certain uh, climate security hazards to arise. And I'll point you to the very last one there, which is internal insecurity and conflict. And this chart shows you that we expect that to be of medium risk by 2040. I think actually we're already seeing that today. We've seen it in recent years in places like the Middle East, uh, in North Africa, East Africa. And I think we need to th come up with some new ways, some new game changers in how we approach climate intelligence to push this analysis forward. As noted security expert Yogi Berra has said, the future ain't what it used to be, right? And we have so many baked in assumptions in how we approach intelligence and security that I think uh, limit us in, in many cases in, in thinking about the future. We, we plan to the past, right? And that was discussed on the morning's panels. And we really need to leverage these new tools that my other panelists are going to talk about to plan to the future. So, the game changer that I would propose in terms of how we approach climate intelligence is increased co-creation, frankly, of climate security intelligence between the intelligence and security communities and the scientists with the expertise uh, creating these tools. I want to see more partnerships between science and technology and security experts, not 
in that the security and technology folks, uh, or excuse me, the technology and, and science folks create new tools, they throw them over the transom to CIA or the other IC and say, here, use this tool. But instead, they're sitting down at the beginning together to partner to co-create this intelligence. I think of it as, as former Vice President Al Gore said, he talked about the Medea program, Medea on steroids, right? And it's not just that the scientists get access to all this great classified data to better understand the climate, but the security experts get access regularly to their scientific partners to create um, new intelligence. And I think the example I would give is a project we've been running at the Center for Climate and Security for the past few years now with the Woodwell Climate Center out of Massachusetts, where we are partnering with them to create analysis of climate security risks in key geographies. And the map on this slide is a map from a, a paper we did a couple years ago on North Korea, right? And so you have the security expertise sitting down with the scientific and the climate expertise, and you've got the quantitative plus the qualitative analysis. We talk a lot about uncertainties. There are absolutely scientific uncertainties, but a lot of the uncertainties are around the people and the governments, right, that are responding to these climate hazards. And as you know, uh, was just mentioned about El Nino and the um, announcement this morning, I think we have a near-term opportunity to apply this kind of co-creation task force model in looking at the security risks posed by El Nino. I published a piece earlier this week in the Cypher Brief on this topic. If we had warning that a terrorist group or a non-state actor was going to do what we expect El Nino to do to our country, to other countries, to security risks over the next six months, you know there would be task force stood up, there would be people leading on this across the security community. I think, I think we should do something similar uh, for, for El Nino and leverage uh, the kind of tools that we're talking about up here. So for me, Game Changers is about how we use the tools, not so much, uh, well, not only the tools themselves. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, we come to the, the point in the program here where our event organizers look like uh, absolute geniuses. And that's because I think you all are going to be very interested in what this next guy has to say. <laughs> Our third panelist is Johnny Dyer, who is the CEO of Muon Space. Thank you, Bart. Um, yeah, and first of all, I just want to say I'm honored to be here. I think this is an incredibly important topic. Um, you know, foreshadowing a little bit of what I'm going to talk about, I promise this was not uh, inserted at last minute, as Bart can attest, but it's definitely <laughs> relevant to some of the things going on outside right now. Um, we and didn't I call you yesterday. Too. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I yeah I wanted to start just by saying I think there's been um, a lot of really great discussion about the need for partnership across a lot of different dimensions this morning. Um, you know, I think Admiral Richardson specifically talked about the need for the government and the private sector to work together. Um, we've heard a lot about what the intelligence community can provide in terms of, of data for um, climate issues. And I, think, um, and I think there's some real important um, opportunities there, again, to collaborate between uh, what the government has to provide from a data collection perspective and what the private sector has to provide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our company briefly, but more in the context of how I see some of this uh, really manifesting in terms of the applications we're talking about. Um, so the company that I started a couple of years ago is focused on lever leveraging a lot of trends that have been going on in the, in the space ecosystem over the last 10 years, specifically the commercial space ecosystem, around the ability to deploy um, sensors in space at uh, a, a sort of an entirely different scale and cadence than it has existed historically. Um, and we're very focused on um, leveraging this technology to address key climate challenges, so very relevant to this topic. Um, and think that there's some, um, some real opportunities, obviously, uh, in the commercial sector around this, but certainly also in the, in the sort of partnering with um, government agencies um, component. And I, I wanted to start with this, because I think this, you know, for those of you that are not deeply ensconced in the, the world of, of space, um, this may not be totally apparent, but the last decade um, has really been completely transformed in terms of access to space and the ability to put things into space. So this curve on the left is showing the progression of launch cost. Um, the red bars are essentially the cost to, to launch a, a, a kilogram of mass into orbit. And you know a lot of this has been driven heavily by SpaceX. Um, but the story I like to tell is that 10 years ago, um, we were when I was at a previous small satellite company, we were launching satellites on essentially converted Russian ICBMs. Um, 
And the satellites we were launching were roughly the size of a, a mini, refridge, mini fridge, and it cost us about $7 million to launch those. Um, we're, our company is launching our first satellite on Monday um, on a SpaceX launch, and it's, it costs us rough, roughly $650,000 to launch the same thing. So there's been an order of magnitude improvement in sort of the cost of access to space over the last decade, and we see that trend continuing. And, and what that's driving is a huge explosion in the number and types of spacecraft that are being deployed. Um, and we think this is a tremendous opportunity to increase um, this top, or improve this topic that's been covered kind of uh, extensively this morning, this idea of situational awareness and situational awareness of the Earth. Um, and so I'm going to give a very specific example of a project we've been working on for the last year and a half, which is very relevant uh, to the smoke outside. So we've been working um, with a number of commercial and philanthropic entities on a mission that would um, really uh, aims to drive a significant impact around wildfire management. Um, and the goal here is really to get to a observation cadence um, that is, you know, at least an order of magnitude between one and two orders of magnitude higher than existing, the existing civil systems that the fire agencies use to, to monitor and manage um, fire, as well as um, to much higher resolution. So they can, the situational awareness um, that they would have in the field while trying to not only fight the fires themselves, but also provision resources days or weeks ahead um, would really be transformative. Um, and I think probably the easiest way just to viscerally show um, how, how kind of, how, how big of an impact this is, is by talking a little bit about what this constellation that we're building will actually do. So it's a, it's a 52 satellite constellation that compares with, um, you know, the existing civil weather satellites that are used for this purpose that consists of two or three satellites, depending on exactly what is in service. Um, and with this type of constellation, we would be getting roughly a glo almost a global 20-minute revisit um, compared with 12 to 24 hours, which is currently the, um, the state of the art, um, again, with the, with the civil systems. Um, and I think, again, to show the, just viscerally how, how uh, kind of game-changing this is going to the idea of game-changers, this is a simulation of what a fire manager on the ground would see um, from such a system. So the upper left, I'll, I'll kind of describe these quadrants. The upper left is a simulation of a fire burning. Uh, the scale, just for reference, um, these are about, you know, the scene is about 10 kilometers here. Um, and what you can see in the bottom right is one of our geosynchronous civil weather satellites um, that is used for fire detection. It has a very high cadence, about every five minutes, but the resolution is very poor. On the bottom left is VIRS, which is an instrument that flies on um, some of our polar orbiting weather satellites. Um, the resolution's much better, but what you'll see is that its update rate is real, it's about every 12 hours. The simulation only runs about three hours, so we kind of forced it to update just so you see something. And then the upper right is a simulation of what this constellation will provide, which is roughly 15 to 20 minute updates at higher resolution than either of those systems. And so you can kind of put yourself in the shoes of somebody trying to manage or provision resources for um, the purposes of fighting wildfire, and it's, it's really a transformational um, capability. Um, so with that, I think there's um, a lot of opportunities, again, for um, projects like the ones that we're working on that are really focused in the commercial sector um, to partner closely with a lot of the folks on the government side and have, um, and, and have essentially enhanced capability through those partnerships. Great. Thanks, Johnny. Our fourth panelist is my colleague here at APL, Marissa Hughes. She leads the environmental resilience research uh, that we do here. And uh, Marissa, before you dive into it, I'll just uh, point out that Al Gore teed you up really nicely. <laughs> so uh, we're all very anxious to uh, hear what you and your team are up to. Absolutely. Thank you, Bart. And I'll jump into it. Um, so a little bit about my background. I've had an opportunity to work across a lot of great climate projects here at APL, but my uh, background is as a mathematician. And so I'm thinking a lot about the game changers in terms of the models, the information, what, how we can inform those decisions, and especially how AI and data science can have an impact in these spaces. So as we get more and more earth science data, thank you, Johnny, um, how can we use that data to our best advantage to prepare ourselves as a nation? So on the topic of climate trace and being able to sense the present, how do we know where all of these global emissions and all these climate change 
which drivers are coming from today. I think that's a real challenge if you want to target technology developments in order to reduce those emissions. And so that's what the goal of the Climate Trace Coalition is. And it's a partnership across different organizations. Um, it's an international collaboration to try to identify those sources across every sector using satellite data and machine learning. So specifically at APL, we've been focusing on the road transportation sector. And we're combining satellite data imagery with machine learning, specifically deep learning, to try to understand the traffic levels on every single road segment that we look at. So kind of in that exquisite accuracy and detail of where those emissions are coming from. And at first we were looking in the United States. Last year we released data up to 500 of the biggest uh, emitting urban areas worldwide, and this year we're gonna be getting up to 10,000 with no plans to stop there. So by integrating across all of the different sectors, we can start to understand where these emissions are coming from and really start to drive them down. Now, that's monitoring the present. Another challenge that we have to think about is forecasting tomorrow. I think a theme we heard this morning was about the operational environment changing. And as we know, one of the worries about climate change isn't just the changes in averages, but that increased variability, that you're gonna be in a rapidly changing operational environment. And how do we provide tools for the short-term forecasting needed for those types of operations. So there's a lot of work that's being done on humanitarian and disaster response and understanding how to increase situational awareness there. But there are also some new challenges that we're going to be facing. We talked about Arctic operations and having increased traffic there. So if you're gonna be sending a variety of ships with different levels of ice hardening in the Arctic, you need to know how that ice is starting to freeze and thaw and move and crack so that you can plan the best navigational route. So we've been able to combine synthetic, uh, SAR, synthetic aperture radar data, as well as uh, visual data and deep learning in order to be able to see where the ice is and forecast where it'll be tomorrow. So you can see the evolution of uh, an ice path on the screen. So you can get not just that pixel by pixel accuracy in terms of our forecast versus the truth, but also larger scale changes like the closing of a key passageway. Also, of course, there's air quality, so don't need to justify the challenges there, but it is a challenge that's increasing that we're not accustomed to dealing with. So this is a, another one that we wanna be able to provide the best information on how it's gonna affect populations, training, and operations at very high scales of resolution and accuracy. So we're working with NASA and NOAA in order to use artificial intelligence methods to emulate and accelerate these models. Like a lot of Earth system models, one of the challenges is in computational time and the amount of computation that's needed in order to look across higher resolutions and more potential scenarios for how these air quality threats might transport down up from Canada down to, to Maryland, for example. And so use, by using deep learning, we can move from being able to run these models in hours to being able to run them in seconds um, well, with a really great approximation of what it's gonna look like. And so that can unlock new capabilities to understand air quality more at the neighborhood level uh, where it's really having impacts. And of course, whenever we're talking about climate change, there's the long range concerns. So how do we plan for the future? One thing I wanna note is that if you're doing any kind of engineering right now for defense systems, you have to expect that a lot of those defense systems are gonna be deployed for decades. Um, you might be planning for them to be out there for 30 years. They might end up out there for 50. Uh, so how do you go about really doing systems engineering that incorporates climate change as a factor? So we wanna be able to identify what the future operational environment looks like and use that to our advantage to make sure that we are investing in the right technologies and solutions to operate in that climate changed world. So on the left, there's a visualization of high turbulence days across the last few years versus in the 2080s and 90s. And that orange captures where you're gonna see more and more high turbulence over time. So differences in things like the amount of moisture in the air really are gonna impact our communication systems our, and our sensor systems. And we need to start engineering towards those climate changed parameters. We also have to start worrying about and examining 
those less understood but higher impact future events. So we've been working on the DARPA ACTM program that was mentioned this morning about climate tipping points and specifically looking at the AMOC or the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, that conveyor belt of the ocean that regulates the exchange of hot and cold water and temperatures. And there's been a lot of concern about indications that the AMOC is slowing down and may in the future come to a grinding halt and not be able to start up again, which would create a really, really fast tipping point in climate change. We would see a lot of, a lot of uh, different and, and concerning scenarios having to do with fisheries and, and weather. So how can we predict whether that's gonna happen and how can we assess that when these climate models themselves are so large, um, computationally intensive and difficult to work with? So we went about this in a very interesting way with a lot of expertise in AI. Um, if you know anything about AI, it's probably that it's very good at winning games. Um, it's good at chess, it's good at Go, it's good at StarCraft now too, I hear. Um, so how could we change climate uh, tipping points into a game? That's what we looked at here. So we created a, a climate game with two players, one of which the, of the players was trying to come up with scenarios where the AMOC would shut down. So it's modifying the parameters and creating future Earths where you wouldn't have that AMOC running. The other player is trying to predict whether or not the AMOC is gonna shut down. This gives you a fun game, for one, um, but also uh, a great training environment where these two AI can go back and forth. And what you end up with is a fantastic tool for generating these tipping points for scientific study and an early warning system that can tell you if it might shut down. So I'd really be excited to see more novel applications like this of emerging types of AI into the climate space. Cool, great, Marissa, thank you. Uh, so now we're gonna move into a little bit of discussion and then we'll come back to audience Q&A um, before we wrap up. So um, prepare your questions uh, now. Um, to kind of move us into the discussion, uh, I want to come back to something that the panelists and I talked about when we were uh, you know, pre-gaming a little bit, and that was how to frame climate intelligence um, and you know, break it down into some simpler terms. And we kept coming back to kind of a two-dimensional problem that had to do with space on one dimension or time on the other dimension and how climate intelligence, um, we heard about this a little bit this morning, you, know, you, want, you want intelligence across all the time scales from tomorrow to 100 years from now, and at that resolution level, we want global situational awareness, but we also want it at the street or the, the river level and, and how that's a challenging uh, framework to kind of think about. So my, my first question, I'm gonna start with you, Steve. Um, how, how do you and your organization think about these time and space dimensions? And do you have any examples of uh, technologies or activities that are focused uh, within that grid somewhere? Yeah, thanks for the question. And this is one that could take up a couple of hours to talk through. Um, <laughs> My agency has responsibilities to, to predict the future from minutes out to centuries. Uh, and one of our challenges is unifying our models. We have traditionally used separate models for short-term environmental phenomena prediction, think tomorrow's weather, and long-term century scale climate models. We are now trying to integrate those models. So that is one of the largest game changers for us. That adds computational efficiency, it reduces the maintenance of multiple sets of models, and it also allows us the seamlessness that we need on a temporal scale. From a defense and intelligence standpoint, subseasonal to seasonal, two weeks to three months, is a really, really critical time period and is also one of the hardest to predict. From just a weather standpoint, think about Hurricane Ian. Think about the snowstorms that hit Buffalo. Think about the atmospheric rivers that hit California. That's just within the last seven months. Getting any one of those wrong has huge implications for our nation, our security, export those elsewhere in the world, and we have potentially politically destabilizing events. So one of our largest game changers has been unifying models, creating a smaller suite to maintain, and smoothing the edges between what were formerly disparate modeling systems uh, across the time scale. Great, thanks Steve. Uh, panelists, if you wanna jump in any time, go ahead. But uh, um, I'm gonna move us on to the next question. Uh, and here, you know, I'm, I'm 
tempted to start diving into those individual components of that analysis pipeline that I described earlier. But before we do that, I want to kind of stay at that systems level. And this question is going to be for Aaron. Um, from that systems perspective, how should we be thinking about developing and operationalizing game-changing technologies for climate intelligence so that we have impact with this intelligence? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think one that the intelligence community has struggled with for a long time across a lot of issues is there's there's plenty of technologies out there right and you know we heard about some really great ones on the panel but how do you make them usable and actionable for for intelligence analysts for intelligence managers and that's where i think you know bringing the two communities together as i said earlier in the in the creation stage of these things is really important, right? So there's buy-in from the beginning. You also need to create a demand signal, I think, from senior policymakers that it's expected that these tools are used, right? That they want <laughs> the use of these tools. Um, and I think it's about people as well, as was mentioned in the earlier panels, of who do you have in the jobs in the intelligence community who are responsible for this kind of analysis and this warning. I don't think you necessarily need to hire a bunch of climate scientists to work at CIA and elsewhere, but they need to know how to talk to climate scientists. They need to know how to look at your models, Marissa, and, and understand what's going on there, right? Um, and so you need science literacy, you need data literacy, right, among the, the security community and cadre in a way that I think has not traditionally been expected or, or hired for. Yep. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so let's, let's dive into that pipeline. And right at the front end are our sensors and our data collection. So Johnny, this question is going to be for you. What are some of the key challenges that need to be addressed? And what are some promising approaches? And, uh, and maybe to be more specific, uh, you said you had 52 satellites. Where'd 52 come from? Yeah, that's <laughs> a good question. Um, yeah, I think in terms of challenges, I mean, I think this question of time and space is a really good way to start, right? So. A lot of the, um, you know, if we think about the time scales of prediction, for instance, and we're trying to operate instead of looking at just climate models that maybe are trying to understand kind of very large secular trends over long, long time periods and moving more towards sort of um, adaptation measures where we're responding in real time to things that are going on on the ground, like wildfires, for instance. It really drives the need for a much higher temporal cadence and much lower latency stream of situational awareness. Um, and, you know, again, our perspective is as climate is a global challenge and satellites are a really key uh, capability for uh, monitoring um, global systems, um, this ability to start deploying in numbers, in large numbers and, and you know, filling the skies with sensors really enables you to move down that space time kind of space in a very powerful way um, and in ways that traditionally have just been um, precluded due to things like cost. And so, um, I think that's um, a really important part of, 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 this, of this question. And there's still many challenges in terms of once you're collecting data in that way, how do you actually get it used? How is it distributed? Um, things like the latency that data is actually delivered to somebody that's trying to act on it, it is another critical challenge. I mean, it's, it's one thing to collect data very frequently. It's another thing to actually get it into the hands of somebody in the field that can make use of it on a short time scale. So I think that's also a really important component of it. Yep, yep, good. Um, just the scaling is a nice segue into our, into our last question, prepared question, then we'll turn it over to the audience, so, so get ready. Um, and that's, uh, I saved this for last because this one's about AI, and, and we're seeing an AI just scaling your algorithms and your, your parameters can have a big benefit. Um, I saved this for last because I would talk all afternoon about it um, <laughs> if, if, uh, if you let me. So uh, Marissa, this is going to be geared towards you. And it's a pretty open-ended question, but how, how is AI, machine learning, big data, uh, contributing to um, the generation and, and interpretation of climate intelligence? And where do you see maybe the most promise? Yeah, uh, that is a big question. <laughs> I think, so I think it's, it's contributing in being able to integrate all of these different data sets, find which data sets are the most useful, and being able to create a coherent picture of everything that's happening together. So as we're talking about those challenges about cutting across different resolutions and different timescales, I see a lot of potential for AI to help with that, with that integration and that 
kind of common operating picture of all of the data coming together on Earth systems. And I think another both challenge and opportunity for AI is to really think about uncertainty in different ways. So, and this is one of the challenges with operationalizing AI is that the uncertainties might be not well understood. Um, and in general, we need to find ways to better characterize uncertainty and and communicate those to the people making decisions, right? Uh, on every time scale and across all of these domains, that's going to be an issue. And so being able to run lots and lots of models faster and faster, being able to explore parameter spaces, being able to have a lot of different structures to your model and comparisons and ensembles, I think that's a huge opportunity for AI to even be automatically generating new models and exploring that space so that we can understand what our confidence levels are, and we can increase those, and we can really make it a, a very valuable tool for decision makers. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. When it comes to AI, the uh, uncertainty quantification is a, a big issue here. So, okay, let's uh, open it up for questions, and we'll start right here in the middle. Great, thank you so much for this really fascinating panel. Um, so Marissa, I actually have a couple questions for you. Um, so I'm uh, sorry, my name is Marisol Maddox. I'm with the Polar Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, I do all things Arctic. So I have two Arctic related questions. Um, one, um, for your sea ice forecasting AI model, um, how are you validating it? Like, is it based off of uh, total ice extent or mm -hmm. something else? Yeah, we looked at both the, the ice extent and the boundary and how they were aligning with the, the model forecast versus reality. Okay. Because so the like, goal was goal is to understand like the next seven to ten days of where the ice is gonna be so we can then retroactively compare and validate that. Okay, so it is actually where the ice is gonna be, because traditionally with total ice extent, they don't actually say where it's gonna be, it's just the, the actual amount, but that's pretty important for operators, so that's really interesting to hear. Um, and then my other question is um, just around emissions forecasting. Are you looking at all at um, permafrost and methane in the Arctic? Because there's, that's certainly uh, an area where there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of uh, kind of time frames and, and quantities. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think that's a really important climate tipping point um, that we could be diving into further. Uh, we're not specifically looking at permafrost. The emissions characterization work that we're doing is looking at anthropogenic uh, sources at a sector by sector. So all of the power plants, all of the cars, all of the farms, how are those adding together and contributing to the missions? Thank you. Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, this is uh, for Johnny and, and the team at Muon. Um, for your next generation awareness of the fire spread, the fire line, uh, globally, that type of repeat. Um, while you're innovating and, and you've made your point clearly in terms of game-changing uh, Earth intelligence, then shift gears to the U.S. Forest Service, shift gears to NIFSI, shift gears to multiple federal policies. Uh, I've dealt with it uh, as a MITRE person. Forest Service has $5 billion right now where they're trying to look at an ungodly amount of acres and deal with fuel management. So it's one thing to know where the fire is, it's another thing to reduce risk at scale. Our Canadian partners are struggling and this isn't gonna go away. Would you take your innovation and what you're pioneering and link it over to, to interagency management and getting left to boom? So what can we actually realistically do to, to take your real-time intelligence and partner it up with risk reduction at scale. I know that's a lot, but I'm gonna wedge in on what the innovation you're bringing to the fight, thanks. Yeah, and I, there's a lot of different dimensions to that question, but I'll try and answer it as best I can. So I think, you know, one thing is we, we've been real close with NIFSI and the Forest Service and CAL FIRE and some of the agencies as we're, as we're developing the system for exactly these reasons, and one of the big goals is to have those data very tightly integrated with the existing civil systems. Um, and there's also components of this, which I didn't talk about, this mission that's really targeting pre-fire and post-fire as well. So the full life cycle, specifically some bands related to things like fuels and vegetation, moisture. Um, but I think maybe more importantly than that is, you know, as we um, collect data again at this cadence and sort of the, uh, the, the temporal cadence, it really gives a much better picture for not only, you know, what needs to happen in real time in terms of response, but also a better understanding for how fires burn and 
Uh, more and more can be actually assimilated into things like projective models for fire burning, which ha you know, helps on the risk side in terms of looking at, you know, if you're trying to actually understand how bad a fire could be given fuel conditions on the ground, better models help with that. But also in terms of forecasting and looking forward a day or two or three days, this very high cadence data and a better understanding of the character of fire burning uh, can really influence that ability as well. So I think that um, there's a lot of different dimensions to it, but um, one of the things I think you know, history has shown over and over again is when you, when you are able to get a data set that has you know, orders of magnitude or an order of magnitude higher fidelity in different dimensions, it really changes the way you think about a whole set of problems outside of even the, the, sort of the immediately obvious drivers for that data collection. And I would add, from the NOAA perspective, two things immediately come to my mind. The first is that we are providing um, experimental forecasts for wildfire risk based on soil moisture and precipitation patterns that are likely. So not only is it a fuel management question, it's, it's how wet is that fuel. And that allows for pre-positioning of uh, material and personnel. And the second is that we've invested relatively recently in technology that is mobile deployed for fire management, incident management. So uh, we now have equipment that used to be fixed, that is now mobile, that is able to be deployed to fires to inform the incident meteorologist so that we've got higher resolution environmental observations directly at the sources of the fire. Those are still in experimental stages. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, let's do one more question. From APL, I think this question is probably for Aaron. Um, your discussion of co-creation of climate intelligence really resonates. Um, this morning, um, we heard Sherry Goodman mention physical effects, um, second-order effects like food and water security, migration, etc., um, and geopolitical threats as well. And um, I want to ask uh, about that movement from predicting physical threats to predicting those second-order effects. Um, where for the, uh, for the physical effects, we might have physical models and that sort of understanding, whereas the second order effects are often very social and human based. Um, and how do we do that effectively? Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's a great question. Um, I think there are potentially some technical tools and models that can help with those second order questions, right? We have data sets on economies, on politics, on migration trends, right, that, that can get us part of the way there. But, but the real piece, I think, of that is, is the qualitative piece. It's marrying that model and data on the physical effects with qualitative expertise, right? And whether that's in our um, intelligence and security agencies, maybe if we're talking about allies and partners, it's, you know, sharing that physical effect information with them as they think about what's happening in, say, NATO or the EU or the Indo-Pacific, right, ASEAN, our, our partners there. Um, but I, I think it's, it's a combination of the two, and it's really making sure that the climate piece and climate intelligence isn't siloed off in the climate office somewhere, right? But it's really fully integrated into our regional shops, regional analysis. You know, we talked about the pacing threat being China this morning. Anyone who's looking at China in the government better have an understanding about how climate issues are shaping whatever it is they're looking at vis-a-vis -vis China for those geopolitical questions. So it's, it's a combination of the two together um, and, and from the very beginning. Great. Great. All right. So uh, I'd like to wrap up with a lightning round question. Uh, and each panelist gets one uh, maybe two minutes, uh, <laughs> to respond to the following question. As you look out on the horizon for the next five to 10 years, what is a promising area of research or technology that gets you excited because of this significant impact it may have on climate intelligence? And uh, to kind of bring us full circle, we're going to go in reverse order, and we'll start with Marissa. Thanks, Bart. And well, you know I'm going to say AI. Um, specifically, um, I'm really excited about physics-informed neural networks. Let me talk a little bit yeah, about explain that. Explain that so, for us. Yeah. <laughs> so one of, one of the problems with AI is that it's very, very data hungry, right? You need a lot of training data, and you need to have training data that's pretty similar to the kinds of situations that you're going to encounter in the wild, um, or the AI may behave in unpredictable ways. And this new concept of physics-informed 
form neural networks is about combining not just regular training data, but also laws of physics and physical equations and partial differential equations, always my favorite, um, to, so that your AI can be trained on a combination of those two. So it's rewarded for doing well on data and it's rewarded for doing well on physics. And since we're concerned in this climate space about first a lot of physical models, because we're talking about Earth systems, but also being able to apply these models when we're looking at an unprecedented event, when we're looking at something we've never seen before, an emerging situation. And so I think that capability specifically in AI is going to bring a lot to bear on these climate intelligence challenges. Right. Johnny. Uh, well, Marissa stole some of my thunder, but I'll try it. But I, it's actually have a related or a similar kind of argument. I think the intersection of, um, you know, dramatically larger data sets that can feed machine learning models um, and also the intersection of sort of the machine learning sphere with things like more traditional data assimilation, which I think is also related to physics-inspired machine learning um, that, that, that enable us to use these explosively large data sets more efficiently, integrate them more rapidly into things like predictive modeling that, that, that NOAA does, I think that combination is gonna really transform the way we think about forward-looking prediction. Awesome, all right, so we're two for two for AI. Uh, Aaron. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, uh, one thing I've been thinking about a lot that I'm really excited about is this new satellite that, that JPL launched, NASA launched last year, the Surface Water and Ocean Topography SWAT is the, the acronym to measure like 90% of the Earth's fresh and, and ocean water to a much greater resolution than they ever thought previously possible. And I was out at JPL uh, earlier this spring in April and they had just gotten the first images from that satellite and they were so excited because the resolution was even better than they thought. And what makes me excited about this is not just the satellite, but their interest and willingness and excitement about understanding the security implications and applications of that data. Right, and their interest in partnering with the security community and making sure the data was accessible and understandable. And so, I mean, I, sound, I know I sound like a broken record, but their willingness to, to partner to get that information in the hands of the folks who could really use it to do better security analysis going forward. And so I'm excited about that satellite, but also that approach. Yeah, great. Steve. So the easy answers for me are greater observational capability through new technologies, particularly those that are uncrewed. That's the easy answer. I think the more powerful answer as a game changer is the recognition that we're never going to be able to know all that we would want to know. And the natural sciences are now being complemented with the social, behavioral, and economic sciences. And so we are using cultural anthropology, behavioral psychology, economics, to help us understand the applications and then those results feed into how we're investing in the biophysical sciences for our climate modeling and observations. I wanna conclude my remarks by saying, I started early in my remarks at the beginning saying, the climate crisis is an oceans crisis. June is the National Ocean Month. Today is the World Ocean Day. So happy World Ocean Day from the NOAA representative. Um, and remember the big connection between our seas and what goes on in our atmosphere. Yeah, thanks. Um, we, we clearly ran out of time. I think for every response, I wrote down uh, one or two questions. Steve, that last one, I might have wrote down five questions. But um, we're, we're out of time. Uh, we will have an opportunity to continue the discussion uh, afterwards in our reception area with our demos, uh, so you can find our panelists there. Um, we'll also have a number of uh, technologies that they talked about on display back there as well, and some of the teams that work on those. So um, please join us uh, at the conclusion of the uh, panels uh, for that part. Um, and to just to wrap up, well, when it comes to climate change, I'm an optimist. I hope that you've been inspired by our panelists and the technologies and the game changers that they brought forward just as much as I've been inspired here today. And uh, with that, uh, please join me in thanking the panelists.